Thank you very much indeed, Heather, for the lovely introduction. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to share my PowerPoint so that you can hopefully see it. Fantastic. Okay, let me just go into my slideshow. Right, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, taking the time on this Sunday night. Um, to, to kind of come on and hear me. So yes, thank you for the lovely introduction, Heather. My current research, um, my part-time PhD, is on a history of Jewish-Muslim relations in Britain. Um, why did I pick it? It's something of a neglected um, but niche area. There's been a lot more work on the Muslim presence in Britain in the last 10, 15 years, but there's been very little on actual specific Jewish-Muslim historical interactions. And when I started this project a couple of years ago, I wasn't really expecting to find much in the period before the Second World War, before um, the end of the Second World War, 1945. But what I quickly found was not just that there was a Muslim community in Britain that I knew very little of prior to the start of my thesis, but more than that, that there were quite a number within that Muslim community of roughly 10,000 in 1920 converts, about 10% of that community were converts, and some of whom had very significant, um, shall we say, associations with, with British Jews, with Anglo Jewry. So tonight, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the first gentleman, William Henry Abdullah William, a convert to Islam, I'll talk a fair bit about soon. Hopefully, if we get time, I'm going to share a little bit about Marmaduke uh, Muhammad Pickle um, as we get towards the First World War period, uh, towards the end of that. The gentleman on the far right there, Harry St. John Philby, who converted later on, is a very interesting uh, gentleman, but I don't think there'll be uh, much time uh, for him tonight, although if it comes up in the q and I'll be very happy to, to share anything about him. So the main objective of my talk tonight is to show the surprisingly positive interactions um, and extensive interactions in that early period. As I said to you before, I felt I probably wouldn't find much pre-45, but as we're about to see, particularly through the prism of, of converts, particularly Quilliam, there were significant um, interactions. And we're going to begin that process now. I just want to set the scene a little bit for the period I'm going to be talking about because we're going to be starting um, roughly in the first decade of the 20th century. So I'm just going to give you a flavour. This will be familiar to some, uh, but just to set the scene. So by 1900, um, Britain's Jewish population had grown significantly from roughly 45,000 or so in 1880. Um, and certainly by the start of the First World War, it was a quarter of a million. The main trigger in the 1880s and 1890s was immigration from Eastern Europe, partly because of pogroms. After 1905, with the Aliens Act, that was the first sort of restrictive legislation, so the numbers began to flatten a little at that point. So the period we're looking at is when Anglo Jewry has grown a lot for about a decade or so. And we're going to also look at some of the key political issues and cultural issues at the time, because this is where the interactions often took place. So a few words just really about the sort of state of, of Zionism, because that's going to come up a bit in our discussion tonight. So at that point, when we're talking around 1900, um, Palestine, as it was, was part of, had been part of the Ottoman Empire since 1517. At that point, the Jewish population in Palestine was roughly 60,000, certainly less than 5%, although in Jerusalem, the numbers had grown fairly significantly from the 1850s. By this stage, by 1900, Theodore Herzl, some who would argue was maybe one of the fathers of Zionism, had actually come to London and he had spoken, particularly in the East End of, of London, where many of the immigrants gave him a very warm welcome. Within the more established Jewish communities, there was more of a mixed response. Um, some of the more sort of assimilated, integrated British Jews felt a little bit uncomfortable that this idea of Zionism might threaten their role within British society. And within rabbinic opinion at the time, there was a divergence of views. Um, Orthodox rabbinic opinion varied for various reasons, but the gentleman underneath Herzl, 
was the Sephardi chief rabbi, the Chochem, the wise man, Dr. Moses Gaster, who was a sort of the chief Sephardi rabbi of, um, in Britain up to the period of the First World War. He was also a very active Zionist, and as we're going to see, had many connections with the Muslim community. So we'll explore that further in a few minutes. Turning again to the Muslim population, as I've already said a little bit in outline, we think in 1900, probably roughly 5,000 Muslims living in Britain. Now, some of these were, were fairly transient. So you had, um, with the advent of steamships, you had a lot of Lascars, a lot of sailors, especially in port towns. But you also had, with Britain's colonial links, a lot of um, sort of wealthy Indian Muslim students who would come to study law and other matters in, in, in uh, Britain. Um, and by 1920, by the end of the period of talk, that population had gone up to roughly 10,000. And as I had said earlier, around 10% of those were converts. And the converts I'm going to be picking out, you may be thinking, well, are they peripheral? Are they representative of the Muslim community? They were very, very well accepted. And as we're going to see with William, not just accepted, but really quite pioneering. So by 1920, the focus of British Islam had shifted from Liverpool, which we're going to look at in a minute with Quilliam, towards Woking in Surrey, south of London. Um, and the reasons for that will become clear later. So in this talk, I'm going to try and go through some of the particular interactions that took place, starting with Quilliam. So here we go. Now, William Henry William is very well known, um, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. There have been some scholarly works written about him, as well as um, a foundation set up, the Quilliam Foundation, I think in 2008. But William Quilliam is absolutely fascinating. He was born um, 1856. He was raised in a Christian family in the Methodist tradition. And very early on in his life, from the age of eight, he was taken by his grandpa to temperance meetings, basically about uh, problems with alcohol. And as he grew up, he looked around Liverpool and he was struck by the poverty that he saw, but also by the sectarianism, the divides within the Christian communities between Catholics and Protestants, which were quite heightened in Liverpool at that time. He trained in law and he certainly went through various Christian denominations. From the age of eight, he vowed not to touch alcohol, which was interesting because at that point he was certainly in, raised in the Methodist uh, tradition. He then went through various Christian denominations, including the Unitarians. And then in the 1880s, he was advised that he was having a bit of burnout and he should go on holiday to a warmer climate. Anyway, he arrives in Morocco, 1882, and he starts, like many of the converts, absolute fascination uh, with Middle East, with North Africa. And they say that when he was in Morocco, he sat down and he had a conversation with a Jew and a Muslim in Morocco, and he was the nominal Christian. And this conversation apparently was quite inspiring. Eventually, he officially converted in 1887, um, publicly renounced Christianity in 1888 and um, changed his name to Abdullah. What is very interesting here is how we're about to see how Jewish Muslim interests were quite similar in a certain way. You see, Abdullah Quilliam was a convinced Turkophile. At this time, the Ottoman Empire, according to the Russians, was the sick man of Europe. But Quilliam saw the Ottoman Empire as a really a real force for good and a force for a, a, a Islam that was both uh, rational and, mo and would be a force for good in the modern world. And the, here there was a very interesting parallel with the Jewish community because the mainstream Christian community in Britain had started becoming more anti-Ottoman, particularly in the 1870s. Um, there were independence movements within the um, Ottoman Empire from some of the Christian subjects. And in Bulgaria in 1876, there was an uprising. And according to the British, mainstream British press, this was put down with ferocity by the Ottomans. And yet it was very interesting because at that time, the British Prime Minister Disraeli, who of course was of Jewish origin himself, although he had converted to Christianity, he was very much against the public, uh, general public opinion at the time in that he was actually quite sympathetic to the Ottomans and saw them as a good balance to a potentially overpowerful Russia. That being said, 
what I would, the key thing here is that generally speaking, Jewish communities in Britain had a much higher opinion of the Ottoman Empire than perhaps many Christian communities had. And this became a point of similarity and a point where Quilliam could really engage with Jews. And we're going to see this soon. So he set up his Liverpool Muslim Institute um, in the late 1880s. The date is wrong now, I've just left as a type error. And between then and 1908, when it folded, it's estimated that Quilliam's personal influence, as well as the influence of the Liverpool Muslim Institute, um, that he personally raised around 250 converts to Islam. The vast majority were Christian, there may have been one or two of Jewish origin, um, but certainly he had an impact there. And what is remarkable about this operation in Liverpool is that we're looking here at a very provincial community. And very often when you look at sort of Jewish history, it's very London focused, but Quillian traveled the country as we're gonna see meeting Jewish audiences. And this was not just a sort of peripheral figure. As you're about to see, Quillian uh, was a prominent um, Muslim. What happened? He developed a very close friendship with the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid II. And Abdul Hamid in 1893 appointed him the Sheikh al Islam, essentially, I suppose, the equivalent of the, the sort of the chief imam, perhaps, of the British Isles by the Sultan. And he became one of the leading voices for Islam. You can see here the weekly newspaper that was produced in Liverpool, The Crescent. Now I've had the pleasure at the British Library of going through many of the, of the editions. It ran for 15 years up to 1908. Most of it's digitized. There were a few bits I needed to get um, literally to access to at the British Library. But what Quilliam wanted to do, he wanted to present Islam as a rational religion. Uh, for example, that it was compatible with science. At that time, there was a sort of, fear in the wider public connected with these the reporting in the press of the Ottomans that there was uh, you know there was a fanaticism and what Quilliam said is actually Islam is extremely rational and he had a real interest in geology and science he was actually the vice chair I think of the Liverpool Geological Association um, so he wanted to present that and within this he noticed that the Jewish community of Liverpool was another minority group and I can assure you from what I have read that when Quilliam came out publicly and converted to Islam, this was not an easy thing to do. In fact, in the early days of the Liverpool Muslim Institute, I believe that they used to have pig's heads thrown through the door um, and that sometimes he was verbally abused in the street. And perhaps that connection to the Jewish community as another minority within the city where there could be a bit of solidarity was quite strong for Quilliam. So from 1900, he started addressing Jewish communities up and down the country. He went as far afield as Glasgow, down to London, but he was mainly around Liverpool. He came to Manchester a few times, we're gonna see. And he was basically, what we later found out, he was given permission by Sultan Abdul Hamid to basically attend early Zionist meetings. And at this time, there was a reason for it. There was a feeling that something could be done where Jewish immigration to Palestine could be furthered um, for the mutual interest of both the Jews and the Ottomans. So there you see, there's Sultan Abdul Hamid who made him the Sheikh al Islam of the British Isles. Um, and he had these beautiful robes and, and various um, paraphernalia he'd been given and when he sometimes spoke to Jewish organizations he would turn up in full regalia and you know he was accorded the most tremendous respect. As well as the Crescent Weekly newspaper he edited um, a monthly journal which was more uh, longer articles on matters of theology, history and other matters. You can see here um, the Islamic World and F, um, an edition 1905 and you'll see this was one of five parts about the Jews under Islamic rule. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because this was his favorite topic when speaking to Jewish communities, because at that time, there was a very strongly held historical view. And indeed today, it's been a little bit complicated, and maybe I'll talk about that further in Q&A, that the Jewish historical experience under Islam had been much, much better than it had been under Christianity. And when Quilliam went to Jewish audiences, 
he gave this narrative and it got the audience absolutely on side and cheering and everything. And we're going to see an example of that in just a minute because I want to show you how Jewish people reacted to Quilliam and how basically the Muslim community in Liverpool became a support network. So there were some theological um, dissensions, of course, but I will tell you that most of Quilliam's theological dissension was saved for Christianity. Well, if we get time again in the q and I'll, I'll talk more about that. The first case study I wanted to show you is um, one of the first times Quilliam speaks in Manchester, and he was invited as the Sheikh al Islam to lecture on the Jews under Christian rule. Now you'll notice the title and this will be significant in a minute. And he was invited by the very new Zionist Association of Manchester. And this is an incredible thing. The meet, meeting was chaired by an Orthodox rabbi, Dr. Landau. There was an, a, a, uh, an audience, I think somewhere around Cheatham Hill, I don't know exactly where, about a thousand people, it was standing room only. And Quilliam gave the most mesmerizing speech from basically the report, not just in his present, but it's verified by the Berry Times as well. So what better? And he started speaking about the generally negative um, view, treatment of Jews. But what was particularly interesting is he often spoke about the so-called golden age of Jewish Muslim symbiosis of connection in Spain. Now this, in recent times there's been a lot more scholarship on this and I think we need to, so the reality is we probably need to get away from either extreme of it being an absolute interfaith utopia or the other end that it was actually generally persecution because the truth often lies somewhere in the middle but what Quilliam got across absolutely accurately and very much reflecting the works of Jewish historians at the time was that when the Christian um, started slowly taking over Spain in the Middle Ages, this was a turning point not just for Jews but for Muslims. And in 1492, when Jewish people were famously expelled from Spain, he emphasized that, you know, this was an end of an era. 300 years ago, when it was under Muslim rule, this was not the case. And Muslims also suffered under the new Christian rule. But he said something really quite um, incredible. At this meeting, and he got a standing ovation for this, he talks about, well, why did the Jews go after they were expelled from Spain? And here we go, this is the thrust of his argument. No Christian nation would receive them. And alone among the nations of the world, the Ottoman Turk welcomed them and gave shelter and assistance. And here is a very interesting line. The garments of the Christian are red with blood of the martyred Jews, but the robes of the Muslim are spotless as the new fallen snow in this particular. So you can imagine at this stage, you've got here a, a crowd of about a thousand Jews in Manchester who feel that there is some hope that under the Ottoman Empire, that there could well be um, some more Jewish emigration and potential for projects. And they see this dichotomy between the way Christians treated Jews and the way that Jews were protected by Muslims, particularly under the Ottoman Empire. Now, of course, you can look at the text, you might say, well, there's a bit of hyperbole here, but that at the time was the accepted historical view. And very much to this day, you know, it's a, you know, there's a lot of debate around this, but very much the Jewish experience under Islam in many time periods was significantly better. But this had such an effect on the Jewish people uh, present that um, a letter was written of thanks to the Crescent newspaper by Rosa Krakowski, uh, Krakowski sorry, secretary of the Manchester Zionist Association. She said that thanking um, Abdullah Quilliam, this for a most stirring and eloquent address to our people, which we all feel sure will greatly benefit our movement. And not only that it will, that will strengthen the admiration of our race towards Muslims. So Quilliam, was gathering a tremendous amount of Jewish support. Jewish audiences were mesmerized by him. They liked what they heard and they believed that with his connections, his well-known connection to the Sultan, that this could be used to improve the lot of their people, which as we're about to see in Christian Europe was declining. So a couple of months after that talk, there is a real turning point in, in modern Jewish history. There was the pogroms in Kishinev in Russia in April 1903. 
again centered around Easter Sunday, which generally was a dangerous time for Jews over the Easter period. And this pogrom ended up, if my memory serves me right, in roughly the murder of 49 Jews. Um, around 1,500 Jewish homes were damaged or looted, and unfortunately, um, as well, many Jewish women were violated by the Russian men. And at this point, there are Jews who are looking on in Britain, thinking this is appalling in Kishinev. And it got a lot of international condemnation, to be fair, from, you know, particularly in the Western nations. And one sort of suffering Jewish man, Mr. D. Aarons in Manchester, he sort of wrote to the Crescent as a bit of a support network. Um, he was so upset by what he was reading that happened to his brethren in Russia that he wrote this. And he said, these terrible massacres should be a lesson to the Jews that wish to assimilate with the Christian nations amongst whom they dwell. Let the rich English Jews support the great Jewish national movement that strives to acquire a legally assured home under the benign rule of that noble-minded monarch, the Sultan of Turkey, for the Jewish people in Palestine, and the Jewish question will be solved. So at this point, the Zionist movement are thinking that this could well be a potential solution. And Quilliam himself, as we're about to see, also had genuine sympathies for the suffering of Jews in Europe. And in fact, he used it a lot as evidence of, I'm gonna just go forward and then come back, of what he felt was Christian hypocrisy, because he felt in the British media at that time that whenever the Ottoman Empire did something, potentially even in self-defense, um, to put down some sort of um, independence uprising, that they were castigated. And he felt that the British press were remarkably quiet when it was Christian, um, persecuting others. And one day in October 1903, he got up um, in Liverpool Town Hall, where there was a very big focus and anger on Ottoman actions in Macedonia. And uh, at this point, he partly used the experience of the Jews to show what he felt at that time was the hypocrisy of the Christians regarding the way they looked at the um, Ottomans. And as you can see in this quote, he says, you know, it's interesting that the, many of these Christian nations cry foul to the Ottomans, but where are they shouting about the tortured Jews? He also had a tremendous interest in the plight of African Americans. And he recorded often in the Crescent the most harrowing stories of lynchings of African Americans. And he said that, is this the way that Christians treat each other? So very much he felt that um, his sympathy for Jews was genuine, but it also lied within this political context. And just finally in this early period, before there's a, a very interesting turning point in his life, he was invited, he was getting very well known on the Anglo-Jewish circuit. And he was invited to give a very big talk in London um, in February 1906. And at this point, his reputation within the Jewish community has been growing. And I just want to share with you um, one letter of someone who basically um, read the report in the Jewish Chronicle about the meeting. He wasn't there, he was in Manchester. But I think the bit I've highlighted in red is probably the most important. So he talks about the fact that this talk in London had been very interesting. There was again a huge crowd there. But it's very, look at the bit here, it's well known in the north of England, especially in Liverpool, where His Excellency resides, that he is a staunch friend of our people, and nowhere does he feel more at home than when he's addressing a Jewish audience. And I think this sells you a lot um, about this, the impact that Quilliam had. Now, I do want to show that, again, he was didn't always get completely uncritical responses. At this talk in London, there were some Jewish people present who felt that perhaps his historical account of the Jews under Islam had been a little bit too rose-tinted. So, for example, um, at the end, there was a Q&A session, as we often have, and um, one Jewish member of the audience basically said, well, if Jews treat, uh, are treated so well by Muslims, because he's mainly talking about the Ottoman Empire, how can you account for the fact that in Morocco, where there isn't a Christian influence, you can't blame it on sort of the Christians, that there's still a bad, the Jews there are in a bad condition. You also mentioned about in parts of 
of Persia. Um, he mentioned to, you know, that I believe there are some unfavorable references to Jews in the Quran. And it's very interesting because Quilliam's response was much of that is the Christian editors and their translations. And um, so there were, he was kept on his feet and there were people who felt, well, hang on a minute, what you might be saying about Jews under the Ottoman Empire, it could well, is true, but it's not the case everywhere. Um, likewise, one other member of the audience wanted more information about, you know, what, what did the Sultan want to do regarding an increase in Jewish presence in, in Palestine? And he basically said, you know what, um, Mr. Quilliam, you should go to the East End and you should speak there to the, the, the most ardent Zionists who heard Herzl a few years before, he was dead by this point, um, and basically that, you know, they want their independence. And I think that the sticking point here was that Quilliam's idea was that there could be some schemes where more Jewish people with the Sultan's blessing would be admitted into Palestine, but on the condition that they took out Ottoman citizenship. This generally didn't come about because the European countries where many of the Jews would have been going to Palestine from didn't often want them taking Ottoman um, citizenship. So this is where there were a few issues regarding the scheme. But nonetheless, these responses, yes, I wanted to show you that there were a few people that questioned him, but by and large, he was greeted with absolute adoration. And this came in 1908, we have a major turning point, and I'll, I'll tell you why. In the first few months of 1908, William suffered personal tragedy. His youngest daughter died of diphtheria. And he'd been extremely active. He'd been in Cardiff, Manchester, London, Sheffield, speaking to Jewish audiences. Again, Zionist organizations about, you know, what could be the future if Jews there take on Ottoman citizenship. But then something quite interesting and mysterious happened. In the autumn, sorry, in the, the spring of 1908, um, William went for a trip to Turkey, to Istanbul which was not unusual, and he was meant to be going just for six weeks. Unfortunately, he left under the cloud of a bit of a legal scandal. His, his main training was legal, and he was very, very well known in Liverpool. He often took on cases, um, particularly he was of poorer people who he felt needed that legal representation. But there'd been something in a divorce case that had gone a little bit wrong. And when he got back, a little bit later, unfortunately, in his absence, the Liverpool Muslim Institute had folded. His son, one of his sons, Robert, had been left in charge, but within a few weeks, the newspaper stopped. And within a few months and years, the whole Liverpool Institute, which he'd spent nearly 20 years building up, folded. But the, that's not the end of the story, because um, when he returned eventually from Turkey to keep a lower profile, he took on a new identity as Dr. Henri Haroun Marcel Lyon, who had actually been a French convert, possibly of Jewish origin to Islam. And Quilliam came back as Henri Lyon. Now, of course, people that knew him before realized that this Dr. Lyon was Quilliam, but many didn't. And he lived part-time in Nottingham, the Isle of Man, and quietly in London until his death in 1932. But even in this new role, he still went to Jewish audiences. And what I would say is quite remarkable here, and I want to thank Yefia Burt for this um, wonderful picture that he showed me. You'll notice um, this picture is from the Society of Theology. This was when Quilliam came back as Leon to London. He got involved in a lot of sort of intellectual cultural organizations. And in the front row, you may see Quilliam. He is um, fifth. He's just, there's a, a bearded gentleman in the middle. That is the Sephardi chief rabbi, Dr. Gaster. Next to him is Quilliam, or Leon, as he was now known. And remarkably, in this society, this was a real melting pot, often of Jewish Muslim cooperation on cultural and intellectual spheres. One of the other people in this picture um, is Rabbi Isaac Herzog, who actually became the first chief rabbi of Israel after 1948. So you can see that he began to still kept his involvement up with the Jewish community. But as you will be aware, and I'm just going to skip on very slightly, a major turning point happened, and I'm conscious of time. Um, a major turning point happened in 1914. Quilliam, who 
in defending the Ottoman Empire was very concerned that if British public opinion really turned against them, that Germany might exploit it. And by 1914, um, as we know, at the start of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, went into alliance with Germany. Now, as you can imagine, once, and of course, Britain and France were at war with Germany and then the Ottoman Empire, this made it much more difficult to be publicly pro-Ottoman. And Quilliam Leon took a slightly lower profile. I may come back to some of it later in, in the Q&A, but I'm conscious of time. And I just want to give you a flavor of one more convert to Islam who emerged in that period. The gentleman that you're about to see is Marmaduke Pickthorpe. Like William, he was born into a high church family. Um, whereas actually, he, sorry, he was high church, William was a Methodist. This gentleman, Pickthorpe, was actually a um, contemporary of Winston Churchill at Harrow School. Very well acquainted, very established within British society. As I say, his father was a church minister. Like William, he visited the Middle East. Um, he visited Egypt and Palestine in 1894. And he started learning Arabic and, and really challenging his own worldviews. To cut a long story short, he, like William, became a real fan of the Ottoman Empire. He saw Turkey as the bright future for um, the, the enlightenment of Islam. But what began to happen once World War I started, the Anglo-Ottoman society, which included many Jews and Muslims, so Hotham, uh, Dr. Gaster, the Sephardi chief rabbi, was a member, Quilliam uh, Leon, as he was now, De Leon, as he was now known as, was also heavily involved. Um, for obviously political reasons, being at war with Turkey, that society took more of a back seat. Um, and Pickthall himself had a bit of a protracted conversion to Islam. He converted officially in 1917, but he got involved with the Islamic society. And at this point, with the Ottomans um, in with Germany and the development of sort of British and French policy with regards to the Middle East, we start seeing a politicization of the Jewish Muslim relations because um, within the British government, Zionist influence was beginning to grow. Certainly by 1917, um, people like Chaim Weizmann and others were becoming much more um, influential. And a meeting was held in June 1917 about the future of Palestine. Now, we know from earlier that there was, in the Quilliam years, in the early 20th century, there was this idea that there could be projects whereby Jewish presence in Palestine would be expanded, both for the benefits of the Jewish community, but also for the Ottomans. The political landscape's very different by now. And what Pickthall does, he speaks passionately on this society because he wanted Britain to do a separate peace with, with the Ottomans, which wasn't uh, likely to happen. And he was actually watched by the sort of secret services as a potential uh, sort of Turkish spy. Um, having said that, as we're about to see, he started um, by talking about, like William, the Jewish Muslim symbiosis, the fact that Jews had been a lot better off under Muslim rule than they had under Christian rule, that the Muslims had preserved Jerusalem and its holy sites for, for Christians and Jews, etc. And his fear was that if there should be the European powers getting involved in the Middle East, that this could potentially lead to a little bit of disaster. But what you'll notice with Pitfall, you can see that the political concerns are beginning to shift because he says the Jewish uh, presence in Palestine, the, what he would call the old Jewish presence in Palestine, that he had no problem with that. But he was a bit worried. He felt that some of the more recent immigrants um, had a sort of extreme and narrow fanaticism, which he felt was very different to the Jews he knew in Europe. And he feared that this could lead to a terrible rupture in um, Jewish Muslim relations. I mean, he declares, you know, but here they hate the Christian, they hate the Muslim. This is, of course, you know, a, a, a generalization, but there's a, a passion behind it, feeling that his Ottoman Empire is being threatened and that to some extent he saw that maybe the Jews are being put in place as, as a pawn here. But what is interesting is that at this meeting, there were a few Jewish people present. 
Some of them completely disagreed and said, no, absolutely, you know, we support Zionism. What you're saying about um, some of the new recent Jewish immigrants isn't true. And then there were some um, who, like this gentleman, Charles Schleich, who actually felt, well, hang on a minute, you know, he was a very European Jew. Why would Jews want to go to Palestine? What experience have they got um, in agriculture? Um, but the point I wanted to make here, aside from the political, is that um, if you look at how he composed, where Islam has always been the most tolerant to other religions, Christianity has surpassed all others in the ferocity of its persecution of Jews and Muslims. And he talks about Salonika in the Ottoman Empire, which was a, a tremendous uh, centre of Jewish life of over 400 years, where unfortunately in that year there was a terrible fire, um, which really did damage the infrastructure of the community. Um, but he says he, you know, he found it Islam ever tolerant to all races and creeds and that for the peace of the world, he wanted to keep um, Palestine as it was under Muslim rule. Now, this was a big debate. By 1917, you've got a lot of debate going on because you have the Balfour Declaration in November. But even prior to that, in the Board of Deputies of British Jews, there's much more those people with the more of the Zionist views um, certainly are beginning to take ascendancy. So what we find with by the time of Pitbull, just going back to him, is that by 1918, the earlier period of promise and hope is beginning to shift. Obviously, the war and the geopolitical circumstances. And Pitbull is worried that if the Ottomans lose Palestine, this would not be a good thing either for them or he felt for the region as a whole. But just because I know I'm almost out of time, I've probably been speaking for too long, I just wanted to kind of finish um, with a couple of, of reflections really about why I feel this is important. I feel this is very important because um, it's very much this, this period I've been researching in Jewish Muslim relations in Britain is very unknown. And I think that we should be able to take inspiration in the present from the fact that there have been only a hundred years ago, this tremendous um, Jewish Muslim solidarity, uh, you know, both with ourselves and locally in Manchester and others. Of course, the political situation once World War I started complicated matters. And there is no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, at another time, I'd look at the sort of impact of Jewish Muslim relations. But what I would say is that overall, in that period, there was a fond sense that Jews and Muslims had a tremendous amount in common. Not only had the Jewish experience under Islam been generally a lot better than that under Christianity, but the similarities um, and the cultural nuances meant that Jews and Muslims could work together. And we see that in the 1920s and 30s, where the imam of the Woking Mosque, which became predominant after Liverpool's closure, again, went to synagogue, spoke publicly. Jewish people were invited to speak in the Woking Mosque. And again, certainly even in 1930s with the rise of Nazism and fascism, what we find in Britain is that British Muslims strongly condemned fascism as anti, as against Islam and against world peace and all. So there's a lot more to explore. I've probably gone over time and I want to thank you very, very much for listening and uh, I'll be delighted to take some questions. So thank you very much. I shall stop sharing. Thank you.